Hi, good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to introduce our opening keynote speaker today. Um, just before I get on to that, I'd like to just reflect on the last 12 months. Um, when we were here at this conference uh, 12 months ago, we were all talking about the imminent or the, the recent announcement of the Shenzhen Connect program, and we're all looking forward to that launch. And 12 months on, not only has that program been successfully up and running, we've also had the MSCI inclusion and a further Connect program in Bon Connect. So just think about the changes and the advancement that China has made on its effort to become global. It's quite astonishing over such a short time period. And I'm sure we're going to hear a lot more about that from much more qualified people than me later on today. But Another part that's very important to uh, us at Thomson Reuters and also to the global economy is the Belt and Road Initiative. And again, there'll be a good discussion later on today, which I'm sure you'll all gain some valuable insights from. But just thinking about the recent announcement by the China State Council on the guidance for outbound investment for Chinese companies and how much it's going to relate to the Belt and Road Initiative. And creating those three categories along the side of restricted and prohibited and encouraged. The, I don't think there'll be any investments in the gambling sector at any time soon uh, along that particular route. But agriculture, oil, and mining, and other such important sectors will be heavily invested in, and this will only help further power the Belt and Road Initiative. And just thinking about how that might curtail the investments given the current strategy of some Chinese companies. It may have an impact in the short term, but I believe that the long-term implications are very positive to help this particular initiative go on. And just thinking that China already, along those Belt and Road countries, has invested over 33 billion US dollars in outbound M&A, which already outstrips 2016, and actually count, accounts for about 40% of all the outbound investment that China has made this year. So it's obvious that the momentum is already there and the direction is there that Chinese companies are looking to increase their presence along the Belt and Road. And at this time more than ever, these countries really need data and analytical capabilities to be able to dredge up great insights and create investment strategies and take the right opportunities as they move into these countries. And to do that, they need factual and trusted data to ensure that they're not only making the right decisions, but they are really advancing their presence in these international markets. So as a major sponsor at today's events, uh, Thomson Reuters is proud to say that we have been in China for over 140 years, and we have over 1,500 employees spread throughout the country. And we're committed to delivering our trusted business principles and our analytics, data, news, and trading capabilities to all the, all the countries within Asia, whether they are dealing with China or not, but certainly to help the advancement of China as they take this globalization leap. So we have a fantastic lineup of speakers today, as everyone has already mentioned, and I'm sure we'll gain great insights from them as we go throughout the day. But what I'd like everyone to do is please put their hands together and welcome our opening keynote address speaker, uh, Dr. David Lamerton. Thank you so much. Well, good morning. It's a great morning outside, and uh, I hope you'll after my remarks, I uh, think you made a good trade for great weather outside and instead stayed here to, to listen and I look forward to the Q&A. Uh, just on this Belt and Road Initiative, just, and I hope it comes up in Q&A, this summer uh, I have a big project, a book-length project on uh, building high-speed rail from uh, Kunming down to Singapore by potentially three different routes, but I, uh, with my colleagues, drove all the way from Bangkok up to the Chinese border. 
and along the route. Uh, some of it's planned, but I think it will happen rather more rapidly than many people think. And in Laos, it's unbelievable the speed with which this is going on. So I've been tasked with talking about U.S.-China relations. That takes me in one direction, but there's a lot of other things going on, highly germane to the globalization theme, uh, that I'd love to address if we have time in the Q&A. Uh, I want to thank Peter for that warm uh, welcome and you for all being here. And I want to thank uh, Walter Diaz, uh, Jack Lang, uh, Tara Joseph, Anne Le Bourgeois, and Michael Yu, all of whom who played a role in getting me here and get, inviting me, and I appreciate that very much. I also want to thank our Consul General, uh, Kurt Tong, for both being here and for his service to our country, and acknowledge the presence of Deputy Commissioner uh, Tong from the People's Republic of China. Over the years, I've valued my opportunities to speak with AmCham because I always come away feeling I learned more uh, than I gave, and I want to thank you ahead of time for that, uh, that gift. Uh, I want you to also understand that the views that I'm going to express are mine and mine alone, and not those of any entity with which I'm associated. If you'll accept what I have to say as my own remarks and my own thinking, then I'll tell you my own thinking, and then we can have a dialogue on that basis. Just one other prefatory uh, remark, and let me say, I am an optimist, and this is the optimism born of experience, not inexperience. I came to Hong Kong 45 years ago, have seen the transformation here, was the first American group into China after Mao died, and we all know what the story's been since then. So I am an optimist. But I am also what I would like to think of as a realist. And that is, if you're going to effectively produce the future you would like, you have to candidly talk about what the problems are in the present, and then we put our minds together about how to move forward from there. So I'm going to focus on some of the challenges, because I think US-China relations are in a very challenging uh, moment on multiple uh, dimensions. Now, in 1972, I first came Hong to Hong Kong to interview uh, immigrants from China during the Cultural Revolution. For me, one of the enduring lessons from that exposure 45 years ago is that Western involvement here has always required leaders inside and outside of this city to balance local, PRC, and international interests and values. Hong Kong is not a place for dogmatism. The need for restraint in Hong Kong was hammered home to me in 1972 by a grizzled British immigration officer who warned me to keep my nose clean and out of trouble when I was uh, interacting with the emigres here. He sternly warned me not to jeopardize the insulation of Hong Kong the insulation that it enjoyed as the Cultural Revolution rampaged across the border a few miles away. Hong Kong's prosperity and way of life have always required mutual accommodation of Western and Chinese values uh, and Western and Chinese interests. If Hong Kong and the People's Republic of China or others forget this very basic lesson, Hong Kong's going to be a very different place. It's with concern, therefore, that I view eroding mutual trust here. With respect to Beijing, one senses a, founded, a concern about subversion. This along with surging pride, fuel, worrying actions and pronouncements. In Hong Kong, there's been some counterproductive discussion among a few that negatively energizes Beijing, and the local system seems to be concerned with reprisal rather than looking forward. Mutual restraint, mutual accommodation, and pragmatism are needed now more than ever. What does this imply for U.S. policy? For now, I think the best thing that America can do for Hong Kong is to responsibly, responsibly manage itself and its relationship with China. A deteriorating U.S.-China relationship spells trouble for Hong Kong. 
In the few minutes I have with you, I want to discuss the state of play in Washington and Beijing, as I would understand it, regarding U.S.-China ties and suggest an approach that addresses some of these conditions. The United States and China were on a gradually more friction-laden path before Xi Jinping took office five years ago, and problems have grown since. Developments since the inauguration of President Trump have compounded uncertainties and risks. During the 71 years spanning 1945 to 2016, the United States used its dominant economic, military, and ideological power, along with our allies, to conceive, build, and support institutions and regimes contributing to global growth and peace. By so doing, America fostered the emergence of other power centers in the world. And predictably now, these increasingly capable countries now have a growing desire and ability to promote and pursue their interests. China is notable in this regard. America has fostered a new constellation of powers to which it now must itself adapt. Washington increasingly must win cooperation. It increasingly is less able to compel it. The PRC is a geopolitical, economic, and security competitor for the United States, but it is not our biggest threat. And there are many upsides to cooperating with Beijing. China is becoming stronger, even as its leaders confront staggering domestic problems. The wisest path forward for America and China is to negotiate cooperation. The very first necessity of America, however, is to get our own house in order. If we fail, America's competitiveness, moral standing, and ability to coherently act in the world will continue to leach away. So what is the condition in Washington, where I live? Soon after taking office, President Trump uncertainly backed off several elements of his campaign rhetoric. Backing off protectionism as expressed in threats of dramatic tariff increases. Backing off a seeming inclination to alter the longstanding One China policy. Backing off impulses towards conflict in the South China Sea. And backing off to some degree questioning how much allies were contributing to American security. Indeed, collective security. At the April 2017 Mar-a-Lago summit in Florida, Presidents Trump and Xi usefully rejiggered the U.S.-China consultative mechanism to focus on core economic, diplomatic, security, cyber, and cultural issues. There also was an effort to address economic disputes with the initiation of a 100-day negotiation period during which key economic problems were to be addressed. Although Presidents Trump and Xi initially labored to reach economic accommodations and cooperate on North Korean denuclearization, the burden of frictions, however, is soon weighed more and more heavily. In June 2017, Washington sold Taiwan 1.4 billion in weapons. Also about this time, the U.S. Department of State issued its trafficking in persons report for 2017 in which China was downgraded in, in terms of its uh, human rights measurement. And secondary economic sanctions were slapped on Chinese trading and financial entities and individuals for indirectly and directly aiding North Korean weapons programs. China's ambassador to the United States, Sui Tian Kai, whom I'm proud to say is a SAIS graduate, uh, Ambassador Tsui responded, Quote, and attempts to create leverage against China on the Korean nuclear issue by challenging China on Taiwan and the South China Sea are destructive. He went on to say, quote, secondary sanctions imposed on the United States by the United States on Chinese entities and individuals according to U.S. domestic laws are not acceptable, end quote. In Washington, moves to give more scrutiny to Chinese direct foreign investment in the United States, 
constrained technology flows to the PRC and vigorously opposed forced technology provisions imposed on U.S. firms seeking market access, they've all gained momentum uh, in Washington. In August, a second round of security sanctions was imposed on Beijing with respect to North Korea. One reason for this seesaw in relations with Beijing is that the Trump administration has, in effect, outsourced its North Korea policy to the PRC. This accounts for the president's initial solicitous attitude towards Beijing when he thought Beijing would, or could, exert control over Pyongyang and is a disillusionment when this has not happened. The president initially hoped that Beijing would or could exert enough pressure on Pyongyang to force abandonment of its nuclear weapons and missile programs. Though Beijing did interrupt North Korean currency earning coal exports to China and sign on to an eighth round of UN sanctions against the DPRK in August, nonetheless, Beijing resists actions that could undermine North Korea's foundations. Anything less than undermining those foundations Ill, will be ineffective in my view. In sum, a very transactional U.S. president initially put several contentious issues with China on the back burner, hoping to achieve his primary goal, namely North Korea's denuclearization. When that failed, the front burner of U.S.-China relations has become more crowded with these initially repressed issues. U.S. freedom of navigation operations in the South China Sea, talk of steel and aluminum tariffs, weapon sales to Taiwan, threatened tightening of technology and investment flows, and secondary sanctions on Chinese institutions and in individuals have once again gained prominence in Washington. Frankly, the U.S. administration's China policy has been all over the lot leaving Americans, Chinese, and the region, I think, confused. This brings us to executive branch decision-making. The White House, uh, White House personnel, including personnel germane to national security, have been in continual flux since Inauguration Day, and this well could remain the case for a considerable period. Presidential unpredictability and staff upheaval drain the oxygen out of the policy-making process. Divisions on China policy among the president's senior advisors have been notable. In the State Department, for example, uh, as of uh, early August, only 24 out of 131 political appointee slots had been filled. At the Defense Department, it was 15 out of 53. At the Commerce Department, seven out of 21. This leaves key agency staff with less politically secure acting officials, many of whom incidentally are quite capable, but they still are acting and not permanently uh, empowered. Foreign governments lose confidence, feeling uninformed. The risks of ill-considered uh, policy and spotty uh, implementation grow. Because of personal inclination, staff conflicts, and dearth of staff, President Trump has given family members a notable role in dealing with Beijing. Son-in-law Jared Kushner and daughter Ivanka have been liaising with the Chinese and advising the president. This blurs lines with the State Department and other agencies and creates the uncomfortable reality that what should be a bright line between family and national interests becomes hazy. Now, in my view, what's happening in Beijing? The driving consideration in recent PRC political life has been an the anticipated fall convening of the 19th Party's Congress, now scheduled to open uh, October 18th. In the run-up to this conclave, General Secretary Xi has wanted to appear cooperative in Washington. At the same time, he is determined to be seen as tough on America in, Washington, in Beijing. So, in April 2017 at the Mar-a-Lago summit, she held out to Trump the prospect of trade gains and a promised 100-day negotiation to follow. 
But when that July 2017 comprehensive economic dialogue discussions occurred in Washington about 100 days later, Beijing gave the United States virtually nothing except beef. Domestically, she seems to be getting stronger day by day. There is every prospect at the 19th Party Congress that we will see just how successful he has been. Though in actuality there are constraints and there are insecurities that he faces roiling below China's uh, seemingly placid surface. Nonetheless, when it comes to a national strategy in dealing with the United States, President Xi is in charge. Washington's premise should be that it will be dealing with him as an increasingly capable politician for the foreseeable future. Under Xi, Beijing has become progressively more ass assertive in safeguarding national interests and rightfully winning more say for the PRC abroad. Beijing views Washington as increasingly alienated from its traditional friends abroad and gridlocked at home. Americans should be concerned when People's Daily carries a piece ridiculing Trump's Washington as, quote, a bizarre soap opera, and saying that the US foreign policy is in total disarray and world regard for the US has plummeted. This is People's Daily. This isn't Global Times uh, uh, saying this. The piece goes on to say that China can't afford to play such political games. As a country with 1.4 billion, China must focus on economic development and strong central leadership is needed. Now, I was just in China not long ago talking to a, a variety of people all over the country, some at senior levels, and one, I would say, very progressive, uh, uh, very senior level official pleaded with me, when will America wake up? Progressive people in China want a progressive po policy uh, from the United States. Um, a muscular Xi Jinping has expanded his uh, asserted sovereignty in the South China Sea, pressured in India in the Himalayas, pushed along the median line between China and Japan in the East China Sea, and is pressuring the ROK over defensive missile deployments as we speak. This trend also is evident in Xi's July 2017 announcement of a red line for dissidents in Hong Kong and his warning to outsiders, not least the United States, not to seek to infiltrate Hong Kong or sabotage it with respect to the mainland. The ratcheting up of political, economic, diplomatic, and surveillance pressure on Taiwan uh, is just another uh, indicator. Under Xi, there has been progressively closer alignment with Putin's Russia, though important frictions remain between them. Geostrategically, Beijing is making international infrastructure investments in ports, transportation, and power grids through its Belt and Road Initiative. And it's doing so on a very big, impressive, and I should say, very constructive uh, basis. There are, of course, uh, uh, enormous challenges f Beijing faces in this effort, and there are downsides. But Beijing's purpose is to make China the hub of interconnectivity in this part of the world. And the United States would be making a strategic error if it thinks the PRC's outward thrust is destined to fail. I think this is a good idea in its broad outlines, not every project, and we ought to be figuring out how we can benefit from it rather than uh, stay aloof from it. To be balanced, some of this is good news for the world order. Increasingly, China's role in the global trade system, boosting its voting share in multilateral institutions such as the World Bank and the IMF, and encouraging China to provide international public goods have been features of US policy for decades. However, the PRC is also using some of its new strength to energize the more sensitive areas in US-China relations and with its neighbors. So, with this kind of complex situation, what might America usefully do? Because I'm always more interested in the solutions 
than the problems, or at least the constructive approaches. It seems to me that we might think about three issues as Americans and people who want to cooperate with America. The first thing is how can we construct an economic balance of power in Asia? Secondly, how can we achieve, meaning we Americans achieve more reciprocity in our relations with the PRC? And finally, how can we, and not just China and the United States, but we more broadly direct, uh, address the nuclear problem and missile program problem with North Korea? Let me just give you a few ideas in each of these uh, areas. Uh, first of all, with respect to uh, building a regional balance of economic uh, power, I think we as Americans have to realize that a set of corrosive developments and missteps in the past have diminished America's relative economic strength in recent years. Among them are the draining not post-9-11 conflicts we've been preoccupied with, Certainly the 2008-9 global financial crisis hit America harder than China, and hats off to China with a policy that brought it through so success successfully. The PRC's impressive economic growth, combined with Beijing's going global policy, is a big reason for the shifting power dynamic. Washington's 2011 pivot to Asia, in my view, overemphasized military power and generally underplayed economic power. Washington's policy at bias against infra cons infrastructure construction in its World Bank, Asian Development Bank, Export Import Bank, and USAID programs, I think, has put us behind the curve on infrastructure. Uh, and, of course, I think the uh, position the U.S. took on AIB at its initial stages and then withdrawal from TPP is certainly uh, not going to uh, adjust the, the balance of power in Asia economically as we might wish. It seems to me that a core question for Washington is how can the United States contribute to build and building an economic balance of power in the region and shore up its economic capacities? The shortening economic leg of U.S. power in Asia weakens our capacity to maintain balance. How might Washington lengthen that leg of economic power beyond reemphasizing regional trade agreements and concluding a bilateral trade investment treaty or a treaty with Beijing? A central part of Xi Jinping's geoeconomic vision is to expand regional links and promote urbanization and growth on China's periphery. I take that to be a terrifically good thing. To make the PRC a central node in this growing region is the objective. For Beijing, East, Southeast, and South Asia means North-South connectivity, creating goods and service supply chains originating in China and extending to the Indian Ocean, South China Sea, Adamon Sea, Bay of Bengal, and beyond. During recent interviews throughout this region, I've noted that the United States is not the prominent economic presence it needs to be. America should become more involved in the construction of regional infrastructure and collaborate with like-minded friends to foster linkages that are not just north-south but also east-west, and we should do so with China as well. East-west connectivity means from India to Vietnam through Burma, Thailand, Cambodia, and on to Japan and the wider Pacific. America needs its companies, development agencies, allies, friends, and the international multilateral organizations to participate. If we don't want Asia to be a sphere of one power's influence, we've got to build other actors into this regional network, most particularly ourselves. So one whole question is this economic balance of power and how are we going to position ourselves? A second area that is really on the front burner of U.S. Uh, politics in Washington, but I think nationally, and President Trump tapped into, is the issue of what we're now sort of calling reciprocity in U.S.-China relations. Once China joined the World Trade Organization in 2001, its trade and financial involvements abroad grew enormously 
as did its global trade surplus and bilateral trade surplus with America and indeed many other countries, including India. Consequently, Beijing soon had the technology, capital, and capacity to seize opportunities of openness abroad without providing reciprocal access for, uh, to China for America and others. The PRC's global trade surplus exploded, creating huge reserves that needed to be recycled uh, to avoid domestic inflation. Beijing brought U.S. Treasury securities in enormous quantities to soak up the cash, but soon sought higher returns by buying tangible foreign assets. China's foreign uh, outward foreign investment exceeded its inward FDI for the first time in 2014. China's FDI has grown and is growing very rapidly in the United States. Compounding all of this, from about 2008 on, the pace of domestic, economic, financial, and foreign trade liberalization in China slowed. Then Xi Jinping came to power in 2012, championing muscular industrial policies. The reality soon became an increasingly outward vaulting China taking advantage of openness elsewhere without reciprocally opening itself where foreigners were most competitive. Consequently, the issues of reciprocity and fairness have moved to front and center in Sino-American relations. U.S. firms and individuals ask themselves, why should Chinese entrepreneurs be able to freely acquire U.S. service and technology firms when these areas in China are closed or restrictions apply to Americans? PRC social media and, and search engines have unfettered access to the U.S. population and Google and Facebook are unavailable in the PRC. Crossing the PRC border and entering Hong Kong is like coming out of a long, dark tunnel. Google is suddenly available. Uh, why is it that Alibaba can operate freely in the United States, but the reverse is not true for U.S. competitors? Why should U.S. journalists have a difficulty obtaining visas to China when great numbers of PRC journalists are in America? Beijing has sizable broadcasting facilities in Washington, D.C., when such a presence is inconceivable in China. It is, however, one thing to identify inequities and unfairness and lack of reciprocity, and it's quite another thing, however, to find remedies that don't hurt uh, innocent bystanders and hurt ourselves more than, uh, than, uh, uh, than Beijing. Limiting Chinese investment, for example, into the, into the United States hurts job generation in the United States. Threatening steel tariffs, as we did in, uh, earlier this year, led to an 18% surge in U.S. steel imports in anticipation of price rises. And constraining Chinese journalists' entry into America invites Beijing to further restrict information. So while American feelings of resentment mount, finding ways to enhance reciprocity without injuring innocent bystanders is hard indeed. But on the other hand, ignoring the problem invites extremist proposals in the United States, and it, it invites contempt by Beijing. So we have to somehow find a way to address this reciprocity issue. It'll never be entirely equal, but we have to be seen as moving in a more equitable direction and without doing damage to everyone in that process. Now, North Korea. When leaving office in January 27, President, 2017, President Obama told President-elect Trump that the most pressing national security challenge would be the relentless efforts by the DPRK to further develop its nuclear weapons and acquire the means to rein them upon the continental United States, U.S. bases, and already vulnerable Asia-Pacific allies. The late August DPRK missile test over Japan and the recent sixth nuclear test are emblematic of the problem. Upon entering office, Donald Trump thought that his predecessors had been right to want Beijing to put more pressure on North Korea 
and he thought his predecessors had been correct in their assessment that Beijing had sufficient means to do so if it wished to do so. How, however, President Trump also thought that his, press, his predecessors had gone wrong in one very significant way by not making it worth Beijing's while to apply the necessary pressure. Therefore, the new U.S. president said that Beijing needed to twist the DPRK's arms more and suggested that Washington might be willing to provide concessions to Beijing for that pressure in other areas. And he mentioned trade and Taiwan as areas where trade-offs might be possible. And my question is very simple. Is that a credible policy? Would Washington really ease off on PRC unfair trade practices because Beijing helped on the DRP? Would American business even support such a proposition? Would the Chinese ever accede uh, to that? Um, with respect to Taiwan, would the United States really be able to ignore the Taiwan Relations Act even if the DPRK, if Beijing was helpful on the DPRK? I, I, I would not think so. Of all the reasons, however, that Trump's approach has not worked is the fact that Pyongyang is able to resist complying with advice it fears would be lethal, whether that advice comes from China or anywhere else. And for Beijing, I think the reality is that a nuclearized peace on the Korean Peninsula is preferable to war. Now, the U.S. administration is left with the same stark choices as its predecessors have faced you know, ever since the Clinton administration. Except the difference being is that Trump has staked even more on this issue and North Korea is further down its deliverable nuclear weapons path. Up to now, Washington has never attacked a nuclear-capable country. There are no easy choices, and they are, however, of three broad types. One choice is accept North Korea as a nuclear weapons state and deter Pyongyang from using them, as we did with the USSR and China in earlier periods. This approach has two variants. One is to seek to negotiate a freeze on North Korean warhead and missile levels and testing with verification and negotiate a peace agreement. The second variant is simply to establish a deterrent relationship with no agreements, just the promise of massive retaliation of weapon, if weapons are used or retaliated or, or proliferated. A second broad option is to persist in a policy of tightening sanctions. This seems to be, the, this is the road we're on, knowing there are limits to the pressure that China will apply and that North Korea has considerable capacity to resist them in any event. All the while, North Korea is going to keep building its nuclear weapons and uh, missiles uh, to deliver them. And the third option is to use force to try to destroy North Korea's capacity or indeed the regime itself, knowing that Pyongyang's death throes could take hundreds of thousands if not millions of South Koreans and others with it. Can we even be sure where the North's weapons are? Who controls North Korea if it collapses and what happens in the ensuing scramble? In my personal view, it is time for Washington in close consultation with its South Korean and Japanese allies to consider seriously acknowledge that the DPRK has a minimal deterrent and to deter North Korea's use of these capabilities and prolifer pro proliferation activity as Washington did with the USSR and China in earlier periods. The wisdom of such a policy partially hinges on whether or not one conceives of North Korean leaders as rational, that their instinct for survival outweighs their impulsiveness. A principal downside to adopting the approach I just recommended is it likely would encourage others in Asia to obtain their own deterrent, and Japan and Republic of Korea would be likely candidates. So there is no 
ultimately desirable path here. There are, are just three bad choices, and I think deterrence at this point is preferable to war. And we're not going to be very tra attractive to our allies if they lose our national, their own national capital in support of U.S. policy. In conclusion, it seems to me that the best thing America can do for Hong Kong at the moment, beyond staying involved and treating Hong Kong as a still distinct society, is to effectively address the challenges in U.S.-China relations. And among those challenges are the issues of more U.S involvement in the economic life of Asia and this region, more reciprocity in U.S.-China relations, and stabilization on the Korean Peninsula. I think if we could make progress in those three dimensions, we'd have a sound U.S.-China relationship. It would be good for Hong Kong. It would be good for our economy. And so I think we've got to begin to rethink some of the shibboleths of the past. I guess above all, America needs to heal itself. So. Thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to the discussion. David, thank you very much uh, for what was a very candid assessment uh, of what is a very complex world at the moment. We have a, a few minutes for Q&A, so if you'd like to raise your hand, uh, we'll come around with a microphone, and please do give us your name and affiliation. Who'd like to go first? Right over here, KPMG. Hi. Um, so my name's Julian Vella from KPMG. Uh, that was a very interesting and insightful commentary on the, on the situation. I just, um, it sort of raised for me a pretty big question, though. Um, you are in year one of the current somewhat impulsive and erratic presidency. Do you actually see, in, re in reality, a number of your suggestions being followed? Um, well, first of all, it would seem to me that um, a real estate developer ought to intrinsically see some merit to infrastructure. And in fact, he came in with the idea of spending a billion or trillion dollars on U.S. infrastructure. So I think what I was describing as a, as a thrust, and at least part of a thrust on uh, infrastructure uh, involvement in this part of the world shouldn't be a major stretch, whether he can free it up on his uh, agenda of all the issues confronting him, not least weather <laughs> and everything else. But I don't see that as so unrealistic. And I, I don't really understand why at this moment he would threaten chorus and so on, because it seems at odds with his own um, policy towards the Korean Peninsula. And in fact, he's already backed off of that. So uh, I, as to deterrence, um, Frankly, I think we're going to have to either conclude we live with these things and think they can be deterred and try to cap any further growth and proliferation, or we're going to have a war, and that's not going to be attractive to any president. So, uh, and I think reality is going to force him in this direction. So, uh, you know, now the reciprocity thing, I think within my remarks, I said, this is going to be very difficult because before you can get China to do something, you have to know what you want. And we have a feeling that we're not being treated fairly, but we don't know quite how to, to approach that problem. So in a way, I think this reciprocity thing is, at one level, uh, is, is conceptually hard to make a crisp set of demands. But, but uh, I don't see it as totally unrealistic. But but the point, I suppose, is are these the three correct domains? Are we postured right economically here? No, I don't think so. Uh, and so what do we do about it? And there's a lot of support, even if the president isn't uh, fully on board, in the U.S. Congress and in states. You know, our states can do a lot uh, and are doing a lot in economic relations. So it's not that America can act without the president of the United States in some important, particularly economic domains. Uh, and uh, so I, I don't see it as totally fanciful, but it seems to me if you're going to deal with policy, you have to first of all figure out what do you want? What do we need? And then how much of that can we get? And I think we've tested this proposition of trying to get North Korea to give up its nuclear program for 20 plus years. And, you know, at some point you just have to say, 
not working, program proceeding, let's get ourselves a different theory here. Is that a responsive? Other questions? Over here in the back. Hi, Paul. David, uh, welcome back to Hong Kong. We met 30 years ago when I was chairman of AmCham in 1987. Well, neither of us are that old, <laughs> right? Uh, my question is, is it true that Senator Robio recently or last year had uh, sponsored a bill on Hong Kong? Uh, if so, what was the basis for that bill? Um, the answer is yes, but I don't, I don't know the detail. Maybe. Uh, Tara, do you happen to know or somebody know? I, I don't want to go into detail without the actual detail of the bill in front of me. So uh -huh. I, I think that would be wrong oh. for me to just, but yeah. um, it, just it is based around was. freedoms in Hong Kong and more uh -huh. politically oriented than economically oriented. Right. That was sort of the... Uh, and I'll get you a copy of it. it. It's easy to find. That was the development behind my, just my initial statement about Hong Kong, the need for mutual accommodation because there is a U U.S. Hong Kong Policy Act, and this provides an avenue, not that Congress needs an avenue, but it provides an easy avenue for the U.S. Congress to get involved. So I'm, I'm hopeful that people here will accommodate to the various interests and values and not polarize it, because the more polarized things get here, the more our Congress begins to pick sides and uh, try to be helpful. Question over here. Hi, I'm uh, John Eastwood with Iger. Um, our law firm, for example, you know, right at the time of the inauguration, uh, I was traveling back stateside, um, not not for the inauguration rather, but but you know to go visit some clients in Silicon Valley. And one of the things that kept coming up uh, over and over again as I talked to other tech lawyers, and and I got the sense that technology of course, has been a, an intellectual property, has been a major um, you know, friction point between the United States and China. And one of the things that people don't seem to be talking about, people talk about um, infrastructure and, and uh, you know, of course, uh, Trump, you know, uh, real estate, I guess, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of money to be made in New York in real estate, I guess. But, but in terms of one of the things that really drives the U.S. economy, it's our creative industries. Uh, you know, the day starts, you know, and you, you use all these devices all day long that are dreamed up, you know, in, in Northern California, you go to Southern mm -hmm. California, and your entertainment comes out of Hollywood and out of Disney and out of all the, the, uh, the, you know, the, the, the things that are developed there. And I was wondering, um, not too much talk has been made about America's tech sector and its future in China. And I know Trump had uh, Peter Thiel, um, who was, I guess, on his side and a big supporter up until pretty recently, and it seems like he's dropped out of the picture. And I was wondering, where, where does that, where's the U.S. relationship with China on technology uh, go from here? Yeah. Uh, good question, and it's, uh, the observation has been made on many fronts that American, the American business community, as, as the AmCham reports show, is objectively doing pretty well in China. Uh, and, uh, but on the other hand, dissatisfaction has been growing, uh, and that this is reflected in a less vigorous business involvement in shaping U.S. policy. Um, I, w I think the most energized part of the business community that I can see is the high-tech sector that's really unhappy with well, partly is the whole cyber control aspect that, that affects them. And then also the, um, what the, I think they would refer to as forced technology uh, transfer provisions and so forth. So I see the high tech Silicon Valley kind of end of our industry is among the most dissatisfied and vocal in the councils of deliberation in, uh, in Washington. But I, I would say just in general that if the US business community uh, and your, your own reports show just how important this relationship is, that you've got to get energized to express your views and your interests. This is, Washington really needs some adult supervision. 
I just want to follow up on that, that question uh, with a, with a wind-up question, which is um, discussion of potential disarray in the political, s in, in Trump's administration. How do you think it helps or hinders that U.S. companies, state governments, et cetera, are starting to, in a sense, go it alone and, and come out and push for their own policies or make their own moves? Is that even more disruptive for U.S. China, or will it help? Yeah. Well, there's disruption, but I don't t th take all disruption to be negative. Uh, and quite frankly, a good example would be, okay, the federal government can't to get together, uh, get a policy on high-speed railroad, but you've got like a governor in California that wants to build a system and is doing his best to do it and has almost an independent relationship with the Chinese. You'll note on Xi's last trip, he stopped out in California and spent time with Governor uh, Brown. If you look at climate change, uh, we, pu we pulled out, or we will and within 360 some days, out of the climate Paris, or the Paris Climate Agreement, and m multiple states said it's not going to change their policy. And in the case of a state such as California, they set clean air standards, fuel standards, and so on, that American industry has to comply with because California markets if not the most important, so important, it's just easier to comply with that higher standard. So I think, you know, federalism isn't always a problem. Sometimes it's a solution. And I think I mentioned earlier, just in response to a, a question, you, you know, the one good thing, I mean, not the one th good thing, but a good thing in our system is there are many sources of initiative. And if we can't get Washington or this administration or however you want to phrase it to act constructively, there are plenty of local governments that are willing to. And uh, certainly local in FDI in both directions is very much supported by Chinese local governments he in China and certainly U.S. So I, I uh, yes, it's messy. But we're already in a mess, so let's get, let's get those uh, constructive forces pushing here. Um, you know, I think it seems to me, if, if you want to say anything, Mr. Trump doesn't have a lot of fixed ideas. It seems clear to me. So let's give him, help him get some fixed ideas. So businessmen helping the businessman in yeah, the White House. Yeah, well, you can hope so. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to leave it on that note unless there's one more burning question from the audience. Anne? Anne LeBourgeois, Hamilton Hi. Advisors. Welcome back. Thank to Hong you. Kong. Hi, Anne. Good. Um, I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about your work over the past year and the connectivity between huh? China and Southeast Asia and what's is there a role for further U.S. Uh, corporate or company engagement in that whole process? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm midstream. I have a, a pretty big foundation grant to look at all seven Southeast Asian countries between Singapore and Kunming uh, and uh, look at the Chinese plans to ultimately, and I shouldn't say incidentally just Chinese plans, I really should say ASEAN plans that China recognized as a good idea and has jumped on. One of the things I've disco uh, discovered, I would say, about BRI, Belt and Road, uh, is that the, uh, it's not just an idea that jumped out of Xi's head or, or, or Chinese heads, but they've been looking around the world, what are some of the plans that countries themselves had, and ASEAN in 2010 created a connectivity plan of highways and rail and so forth, and the Chinese thought this fit in well with their conception, and so this is actually an area of some, there's tension and contractual disputes and land acquisition and how much loan should be given by China, lots of disputes and all this, but this isn't just a Chinese idea getting imposed uh, on, on people. Now, when I read a lot of the commentary, uh, we, uh, the Americans, it seemed to me, are somewhere between ignorance and fear that this is a strategically disadvantageous thing that's going on. I look at it is Southeast Asia, just, that's the part I'm looking at this. This is sort of like 1865 and after America. They're knitting together a continent. This is the transcontinental railroad that's being built. I just rode the high-speed train from Guiyang 
to Hong Kong, unbelievable, going through these really remote places, you know, at 260 kilometers an hour and, and up. Uh, so I think we ought to be looking at what China, and the progress, uh, when I went to uh, Laos, I was reading in the newspapers, you know, this is slowed down, the, the Laos are gonna have too much debt, uh, they're arguing over the right of way and, and colonialism and all of this. And then you get on the ground and I drove along and they're building tunnels faster than you can believe and bridges and Chinese construction um, brigades. You know, th this is gonna, this isn't you start at one end and build linearly to the other end. This is brigade after brigade given a section and they're building simultaneously and you're gonna go from nothing to a system much more rapidly. And I think you're also gonna see this unfold very rapidly, I think, in Thailand. It's a little more problematic, but Laos is a done deal. And Thailand's gonna happen. It's already moving from Singapore up to Kuala Lumpur. So we got the in-between between KL and, and Bangkok to kind of get worked out. But the Chinese are doing it, and America ought to be involved in it. And also, there are many good lines that go on the east-west. Japan is very committed on the east-west axis, whereas China's on the northwest. And we ought to be cooperating with, you know, uh, ROK. Well, you know, where are Bechtel's? Where's GE? Where, where are these companies? Uh, and we ought to be thinking strategically, because this is 600 million consumers that are moving up the value chain with speed, and we need those markets to sustain our continued uh, growth and so on. Uh, it's a little hard to argue, I suppose, uh, invest in, in infrastructure in Laos and <laughs> Cambodia and Vietnam when we have so much need at home, and I'll concede there's that. But nonetheless, I think we have to think strategically because the world's changing. This is 1860s America that's taking place, and we're either going to be in it or not. And hats off to the Chinese that they can see this. Thank you. We're going to leave it on that note. David Lambton, thank you very much for your candid and, and deep remarks this morning. I hope people have a chance to talk to you during the break. Thanks so much. Thank you.